Uh, this next section, I mean, ultimately, it's really just a continuation of what we were talking about before. Uh, I, I flagged at the start that we would have some arrangement to deal with um, the circumstance where the system operator would relax um, instantaneous reserve, or just reserve cover, temporarily. Um, so today, uh, as I say, reserve cover could be relaxed in the dispatch schedule if supply could not otherwise meet expected demand meaning that you take the pragmatic decision that it's better to temporarily have reduced security by sacrificing some of that uh, energy that's being currently held back for reserve and instead use it to supply the, uh, use it as energy to supply demand in real time because if you don't then ultimately you're going to end up in some sort of load shedding circumstance. Um, when this happens today without going into the detail Again, it's another one of these manual post processing adjustments to account for it, but that, that mechanism is really just an approximation. An objective for uh, the approach to pricing this circumstance is that the prices when this happens should signal the long term value, or sorry, should signal that the long term value of not meeting reserve. I'll try this again. Prices should signal the long-term value of not being able to meet that reserve requirement. And what that really means is that you want your long-term kind of dynamic investment signal to say that a unit of capacity should be equally valued, whether it's being used for energy or reserve. Both of those things are equally important. If you essentially un end up underpricing reserve, then over time you could end up with a, an undersupply of the necessary um, generation, demand response, or whatever the form of capacity is that's providing that service. In order to achieve that objective under real-time pricing, we propose to use uh, a reserve shortage CVP, a constraint violation penalty, and we'll flag that this instance of CVP is the only time when it will actually count to set the price. CVPs are, of course, used um, throughout the, me the processing pricing processes today in order to resolve infeasibilities, but generally speaking, they don't set the price. This reserve shortage CVP in our real time pricing proposal would set the price. Um, now, as we said in the consultation paper, we think there'd be CVPs in place for both FER, fast instantaneous reserve, and sustained instantaneous reserve as separate products, but also um, combined to provide um, the necessary signal about which one may have ended up being sacrificed and so on. We haven't. Uh, we have done some modelling work, but at this point, we haven't set forward specific proposed values, and we'd be keen to hear your thoughts on how that should work. What what sort of considerations should be taken into account in any um, uh, algorithm that we would use to determine those values? The general log logic then should be that relaxing reserve in this way should be rare, and a rare contingency measure. But we should do this before we use instructed emergency load shedding. And when we do so, we should signal that the value of that reserve that's being sacrificed for energy has equal value to a unit of capacity that was used for energy in the first place. So logically, the way to do that would be to set this reserve shortage CVP at some value that's just below the first default scarcity pricing block. In the worked example in the consultation paper, we used a value of $9,500 just, just to illustrate that, that principle. Now, what would be different from the way things happen today is that we're proposing that we would relax reserve cover in this way before dispatching some generation or, in fact, other reserve that may be offered above that reserve shortage CVP. So we... Pro I can't just say that. Um, that would be different from the practice today, which means that essentially all offers are... Well, probably they all will be used, but you should say all likely to be used the reason for that is that the current CVP, when dealing with these reserve shortfall infeasibilities, is set at $100,000 a megawatt hour. Um, and f from memory to date, we've only seen two reserve offers above is that six or $10,000 a megawatt hour, um, and we're not entirely sure they were intentional. Um, if relaxing reserve and using reserve for energy is still not enough to, to balance demand in real time, then you'd sort of work your way up the stack and presumably default scarcity pricing at that first block would become marginal, it would set the price and it would trigger emergency load shedding in order to balance supply. 
Um, but again, just to re reiterate, the scarcity and pricing, scarcity pricing values are assigned by default. Purchasers can, purchasers can choose to bid their demand at a higher price to reveal that they're prepared to pay more for that energy. Now, we tried to illustrate this principle in the consultation paper in the figure seven, um, which was more of a sort of horizontally stacked chart, but then we looked at it later and went, oh, that doesn't really work so well, it's a bit confusing. So we've tried to redraw it here. Um, I, I do have more sort of economic style supply and demand curves, but we thought maybe this is the simplest way to communicate it. So j just, just in a logical sense, um, the lowest prices um, on the bottom of the vertical axis and they get more expensive as you go up. Most of the time your um, demand will be met by you know, normal generation offers, so your, your price will be around here somewhere. But let's say you're, you're moving into a shortage situation, so we get to this reserve shortage CVP. Um, I didn't draw them, like it's not drawn to scale, but the idea is that this reserve shortage CVP is just below that um, first default scarcity pricing block. So you relax reserve to the extent you can, bearing in mind that not everything used for reserve can actually supply energy. Um, interruptible load being the obvious example. Um, if that's not enough, you would go through your first default scarcity pricing block. But let's say this is a really serious shortage event. Proportionally, you've been through your first, second, third, so you've exhausted all of the load. You've, you've forcibly curtailed all of the load that you can. That's assigned to these default scarcity pricing blocks. At that point, let's say a higher price generation offer would end up being marginal and it would set the price because it's lower than this higher priced um, demand bid. And in the dispatch price, in order for this to happen, this higher price bid must be dispatchable. Now, you could redraw this stack in a number of ways, right? So you could put this generation offer just above the reserve shortage CVP. So you could relax reserve use that reserve for energy and then move to a higher price generation offer and essentially it's that mechanism that means it's not a cap on um, prices. But yes, things would need to change, the, the interaction of bids and offers and the load that's assigned these default scarcity pricing would need to change over time. But after all, that is a fundamental goal, fundamental intent of this entire project is to bring forth demand bids in, in one way or another. Um, does anyone have any questions on this so far? Uh, Andrew from PowerCo. So if the load, at, so if there's no demand bids at a GXP, and so it's all default, yep. so there's 10 megawatts, it's all default, doesn't that mean there'll be an instruction for that entire 10 megawatts to be shed it, before... It, you see the high price generation offer in the demand bid. Is that right? So if in this scenario you're talking an extreme shortage situation, normal offers can't get you there, I mean, it becomes a bit... Um, the sort of illustration breaks down a bit because, I mean, that would suggest there's essentially no generation offers if you have to sacrifice all of your, your blocks. But for, for the sake of argument, yes, you've, you've used up your normal generation, you've relaxed reserve, you're still not making it, and if you, you can't balance, well, you have to shed load, and you'll keep shedding until you hit zero load if everything was assigned by default to those scarcity pricing blocks. C clearly this is not a realistic scenario, but... I understand it's hypothetical, that's fine, just yeah. checking. Then related to that, given prices are varying by GXP and, you know, your fair and Sierra Nas Island National, um, are there issues, does that create an issue with, you know, I understand this works almost at a single location, Yeah. but once you apply losses and things, does that, does that make it hard to define your reserve shortage CVP to sit below all first default scarcity pricing blocks across yeah. the entire uh, world? It, it, is, it is certainly one of the complexities that, that needs to be taken into account when we work out those CVPs. Uh, it's a very good question. So, yep, please, we could see elaboration on that in, the, in your okay, submission. So, so starting assumption is that demand at the extremes are the top of the north or bottom of the south or on the ends of the radial parts of the network are going to be the ones, you know, those that are most affected by losses will be potentially the ones most uh, at risk from this? Potentially, if, if it's an unconstrained generation shortage situation, then logically that would be the case. Okay, thanks. Um, do you want to comment, Murray? Or? Oh, just going back to the, the earlier point, um, that if it's an island-wide issue, 
that certainly in the first instance, until everyone's got some learned experience of real-time pricing, that our expectation is we would still ask load to disappear at the larger centres where it can disappear without people noticing to the same extent, rather than always kicking Northland when they're down. Um, but the, the pricing impacts would, would be as you describe, but in terms of where the load is shed, if load is needed to be shed, that, that's still targeting the large municipal centres first, because they're, you know, ripple control in Auckland can make a lot of load go away, which people don't notice for the short periods of time. Hello, Eric Levengood. Um, in the condition where you dip into that reserve and you have that reserve converted to energy and you're using it, how quickly does that um, get reflected in future dispatches? Does that reserve is that reserve suspended for quite a while, and are you continuing to operate at that reserve shortage CDP for a number of dispatch periods or cycles, or is it something that's resolved quite quickly? Uh, I believe it, it could be extended. Um, Obviously, that would depend on the nature of the dynamic of bids and offers and what becomes available. Yeah, I was wondering if there's re-offers or how quickly that happens. Oh, you, this, sorry, this, yes, this, this would be under a formal notice, so this would be, again, seeking uh, in, increased offers or seeking other resources to be made available. But yeah, on a dispatch solution by dispatch solution, they're, they're each um, just the one schedule, so if by the time you ran the next one, conditions had changed, then you know, if load natively disappeared, then you might find that the next five minute solution comes back onto the offer stack, can balance everything perfectly. And in terms of how the optimizer SPD scheduling, pricing and dispatch is the tool we use, um, it's always got the reserve stacks, the energy stacks, and it knows the demand. And every time it runs, it's optimizing what the lowest solution is between those. So there's no, um, there's no ring fencing of a, a generation offer when it's been used for reserve or vice versa. It's just what's the cheapest combination I can come up with that meets all of the requirements that I've been told that I need. Does it? Yeah. So just in terms of the schedules, uh, the running of SPD and so forth, um, is it proposed that that would run automated every five minutes, or um, or as it as it is now, where it runs, you know, five minutes past the, the period, and then the operator can choose to run it manually? Uh, and sorry, and, and we had a situation a few days ago where the price was thirteen thousand dollars. It got run <laughs> once, and the operator, energy coordinator, didn't rerun it, and so that stuck. And just wondering if those sort of things will continue to to happen. So I, I think there's a, there's a couple of things there. The dispatch schedule, which is where pricing for real-time pricing comes from, there's an automated dispatch schedule that kicks off every five minutes, and the coordinators can run as many or as few manual solves in addition that they want. But in, in your case, you're being pre-dispatched, as it were, from the non-response schedule, and that one runs once every half hour, and prices and your dispatch instructions are published uh, about five minutes past the start of the trading period and your dispatch instructions apply to the next trading period. And there's no, um, there's no obligations around rerunning the manual NRSs, non-response schedule shorts, um, can be run, um, no but obligation. no obligation. And they generally run if there's a need to revise the subsequent inputs that come off the back of them for the dispatch schedule and final pricing for the upcoming trading periods. Yep, we can talk later. Okay, moving on. Ah, oh, I already said it, I forgot I had these. Um, Demand reveals its preference through bidding. Right. Um, in a way, Murray's already said this before. Um, we, we really do not expect any significant difference in the outcomes under RTP than we already see today. Um, I think I've said this already, but 
very few reserve offers occur above $10,000 or, or something just below that. Um, and the ones we have seen don't really appear to have been intentional. And overall, and again, this is the same principle that applies today, it's, it's preferable to relax security on rare occasions, and yes, accepting that is a temporary reduction in security, um, than to just use all resources, no matter their cost. But again, dispatchable demand bids from purchasers who prepare to pay more than that can reveal, you know, they reveal their willingness to pay for those higher price resources. So through this and a few other mechanisms, um, th these CVPs and this approach is, is not a price cap. Accepting that um, on day one, uh, it's highly unlikely that um, these sort of higher priced uh, bids and offers would, would be used or, or would even, sorry, higher priced bids would be there. On the other hand, you've got, you know, four years to prepare for this. So, and, and I, I, I strongly believe that new technology will make this dramatically easier and in particular storage. Um, well, and unlock all sorts of opportunities for much more dynamic and nimble responses in, in, this, in this context. Um, switching back just to scarcity pricing itself, this is one of those things we, we don't believe is necessary any longer. Um, today there's a, a cumulative price limit or a price threshold which in simple terms says that scarcity pricing stops if the average price for the preceding week exceeds $1,000 a megawatt hour. Um, and if in that event, then normal pricing applies instead. But it's important to understand that this, this limit, this threshold does not act as an upper bound, as a maximum on the spot price you could pay. Because these normal prices could be lower or they could be higher than scarcity prices, including that $20,000, $20, which would depend on the specific circumstances. Um, if you are in particularly tight conditions that were sustained, it, it, it's quite possible that you could get in a situation where um, uh, not using scarcity prices ends up being more expensive. So for a range of reasons, we propose that this would no longer be consistent with the, the underlying principles of real-time pricing and we propose to delete it because any intervention after the fact, as we know, reduces the certainty of real-time prices and goes against the fundamental um, design of this entire work. It could actually encourage strategic behaviour if cumulative prices are approaching that threshold. You might try and make things worse in order to bring in this pricing limit. Um, RTP in a general sense should encourage a transition away from managing these types of cons these um, tight conditions through emergency responses, namely the system operator and instructing distributors to, to manage their load and instead move towards or I have the incentive to move towards contracted arrangements between retailers and other purchasers and distributors or anyone else who's able to provide that um, uh, more guaranteed load control, load management. So you could contract for that service, bid it into the, into the spot market and that demand bid, dispatchable demand bid, could set the price at some lower value than these default scarcity pricing blocks. And if that became marginal, that contracted load shedding would occur, or load management, I should say, would occur, and there would never be any need for this instructed load management as an emergency response. And ultimately, um, in severe circumstances, let's say when something big has gone bang, rolling outages are likely to be used in any case. And, in th and that would highlight again that, um, or I'll restate that, if rolling outages are used, to be clear, scarcity pricing would not apply because that's not equivalent to an instructed emergency load shedding under a grid emergency. It's, it's a different way of managing those more prolonged conditions. And ultimately, uh, the UTS provisions, uh, undesirable trading situation, um, co-provisions always remain available. Um, so that went quicker than I thought it might. Uh, any questions? Yeah. Say that with the, um, the reserve CVPs, that that is uh, almost exactly equivalent to the current philosophy. So, four or five years ago, uh, Transpower as system operator, we had the CVPs for deficit generation, so going short for energy, were priced lower than the CVPs for going short for reserve. So, what that meant was when we ran into uh, shortage situations where we couldn't balance all of the needs, the only way we could free up 
the generation which was ring fenced in the reserve stack because to go short for reserve cost more than to go short for energy was to totally disband the reserve market and to run and dispatch with no reserve scheduled to meet whatever risk we, we might face. And at the time, everyone had a, a discussion and said that wasn't sending the, cri sorry, the correct signals for pricing reserve and it was suppressing the energy price as well. So then the order of the, the deficit penalties were changed. So the reserve deficit is currently at 100,000 and the energy is at 500,000. So natively, when SPD is minimising costs, it will convert everything that it can from the energy, uh, sorry, from the reserve stack into meeting the energy requirements without having to do anything special. So what Justin was, was talking through, it's not, it's not anything new, it just needs to be updated mm. to reflect the bringing the scarcity pricing default bids into the stacks. So the current arrangements just need to be tweaked so that you still get the same effect.